We're talking today with Edward Dove of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and the interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, start us off with some background on yourself, and to begin with, where and when were you born? Well, I was uh, born in Stuttgart, Germany. I, my dad was in the military as well. He's, uh, he was a retired staff sergeant in the military police corps. Mm -hmm. At the time, he was doing customs work when he met my mother. Um, my mother is from the Philippines. Mm -hmm. He met her there. I, so I was, born, of course, born there in a German hospital, not on base. Okay, what year? In 1977. Okay. All right. Uh, now, your father's interview, just for reference, uh, is, is one that I had conducted some years ago, and that is in our archive. So Arlen Dove, A-R-L-E-N, uh, you can find him there, too. So we got father and son team here today. Okay. Uh, so he's there. And so how long did you then stay in Germany before you moved on? I, I would say about a year before we moved. So I was still a baby right. and don't remember, so don't remember any of it. don't remember that at all. Okay. Um, and then... What other stops then did you make while you were growing up? Well, as my dad was still in service, every couple of years we were sent to a new duty installation. Uh, I think um, we went to Alpena for a bit, Alpena, Michigan, Fort Stewart, Georgia. I uh, Grand Rapids here, Fort McClellan, Alabama, uh, the Philippines. Back to Fort McClellan, to Fort Hood, and then my dad retired out of service here in Grand Rapids. Okay. Uh, and so where did you finish high school? I uh, graduated high school out of uh, Northview High School here in Grand Rapids. Okay. And what year was that? 1996. Okay. And then once you got out of high school, I mean, what's the... You get, actually, this gets to a point where you... you begin the process of going into the military, but that was a, a kind of a complicated thing. So take us from, uh, now before you graduated from high school, were you involved in any kind of school ROTC or anything like that? No, I wasn't. Okay. Uh, the only thing I did is uh, in my high school years was scouting, mm -hmm. as my dad was very big proponent of scouting, and that was m much of his military career was supporting scouting for the Army. Mm -hmm. I, he thought he retired from the Army and retired from scouting, and then he ended up getting right back into it because of myself, and then mm -hmm. later on because of my son, who eventually became an Eagle Scout. I, so I always liked seeing what my dad did, especially when he was stationed at Fort Hood teaching kids about drugs and safety. Mm -hmm. And I felt that was an important role of um, police officers and I'm like I want to do that mm -hmm. I at the time I was uh, very um, I guess enamored with West Point but I didn't have the grades to get in mm -hmm. I found a school uh, um, it's a high school and junior college in Roswell New Mexico called New, New Mexico Military Institute mm -hmm. it's considered the West Point of the West so I decided to go there for uh, I spent about a year there at New Mexico Military Institute. Mm -hmm. I was working on criminal justice and was in their early commissioning program at the time to become an officer. Okay. And then how did that play out? I, unfortunately, I, I, academically, I didn't do well. So at the end of the year, I was disenrolled for academics. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed the school a lot. And I, I have very fond memories of being there. I, at the end of that time, they said, well, um, you took a scholarship with us. You can either join the Army or pay back the scholarship. And I said, well, I want to join the Army, but I want to choose what I want to do, not mm -hmm. let the Army choose what I do. Okay. So I went and spoke to a National Guard recruiter. I went in there with my uh, father. He remained quiet initially. And... They asked what I wanted to do. I said, well, I want to be a military police officer. It threw the recruiter off. And he's like, normally uh, candidates don't come in here knowing what they want to do. And he actually offered me a slot as a combat medic in the uh, Grand Valley Armory. And I had to think about it. My mother did not want me being an MP officer like my dad. Mm -hmm because she looked at it, he retired from the Army, and all his education 
really didn't do much to get him a good job on the outside. She felt medical was going to be the, uh, the best place for me to go. Mm -hmm. And I had to think about it when they offered me the slot. I didn't want to be cooped up indoors the whole time. I wanted to be outdoors. And as a combat medic, I knew it was going to be the best of both worlds. I'd be outdoors and I'd be medical like my mother wanted. Mm -hmm. So I accepted that job with the um, 126 Infantry as a combat medic. Okay. She didn't realize until later on what the job entailed. All right. And so the 126, that is the guard unit that's based in the Grand Rapids area? Yes, sir, it is. Okay. All right. Uh, and so when did you join them? I enlisted with uh, 126 Infantry in July of 97. Okay. And then how long did you stay with that unit? I was there until about October 98, enough, long enough really to get through basic training and my advanced individual training as medic. Okay. And so where did you do your basic training? I, well, I actually did basic training twice and I graduated both times. Okay. The first time I did ROTC basic before I went to M New Mexico Military mm -hmm. Institute, which was six weeks at Fort Knox, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. We had drill sergeants, but we primarily led ourselves. Uh, we were learning the leadership roles of every leadership position in a company. Uh, my actual basic training was done at Fort Jackson, South Carolina in October of 97. Okay. And so how would you compare those two training experiences? What's different about Fort Jackson? Um, well, I needed the one at Fort Jackson for enlistment. I actually felt I learned more at Fort Knox, even okay. though it was a shorter amount of time. We still got everything in we needed, and we learned a little bit more about leadership at the time. Okay. Uh, now, the groups that you were training with, uh, how similar or different were they in the two places? Um, of course, ROTC is geared m more toward uh, producing officers mm -hmm. in into the Army, whereas basic training, everybody is starting out as a private right. and learning how to do their uh, initial role into the military, which, as my dad explained, it was basic infantry for everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, was there a difference in terms of how you were treated, in terms of discipline, punishment, kinds of stuff you had to do? Um, Discipline-wise, for the RTC basic, because we were college students, we had a little more free time and leeway to conduct ourselves mm -hmm. as we wanted to, especially when we were leading ourselves. Okay. Whereas basic training, the drill sergeants were in charge of everything. All right. Now, did it help you or hurt you at Fort Jackson that you had already been through the ROTC version? It was initially a help, but in a way I kind of knew too much for my own good being there. So in the long run, I. I got removed from my roles for minor things because they expected more out of me having a little more training. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, uh, in, in this year, sort of late 90s and that kind of thing, um, was it still a system of break people down and build them up again as it had been back in the Vietnam era? Or was it kind of gentler as far as you can tell? Um, to me, uh, in the way, I, I lead my soldiers currently in the State Defense Force. Mm -hmm. Initially, you kind of have to break everybody down to build them up as a team. That way there's a little less I and they understand how to function together better. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but in terms of, and, and if you screw up, what do they do to you? I, there still would be mass punishments where everybody's going to do a little bit of I physical training mm -hmm. and for everybody to learn from that mistake, I, I, especially in basic training. I'm not sure if that's the way they conduct it now, but at least through my basic training, that's the way we did things. Okay. All right. Uh, now, when you were doing the basic training then, uh, was it with all men or were there women in the unit as well as men? Uh, we were co-ed at the time okay. for both ROTC basic and my actual basic training. All right. Um, and how well did that go? I had no issues with it. I worked well with the females, and they had a lot to teach me at the same time. Okay. All right. Now, 
So the, the AIT, the Advanced Individual Training that you get, that's now directed toward being a combat medic. Yes. So where was that and what happens then? I went to Fort Sam Houston, Texas in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. I did about 88 weeks as a 91 Bravo, which is the first MOS I picked up as a combat medic. Mm -hmm. I, they teach a little bit of everything as far as the medical field because the medics can be interchangeable into any role and help out. What's the range of roles that a medic might get? Well, as a combat medic during my uh, career, I, um, they teach us, um, current medics are EMT basics, a really basic first aid and drive an ambulance. Mm -hmm. I, however, combat medics are taught how to do IVs, draw blood, give shots. Mm -hmm. I, we're taught to perform chest tubes now. Mm -hmm. to be able to maintain a casualty on the battlefield if we can't get them out right away. Mm -hmm. uh, surgical crikes. And, um, of course, chest tubes is a surgeon skill. Mm -hmm. Surgical crikes, a paramedic can do. Uh, shots, a paramedic or, like, medical assistant or nurse can do that. Mm -hmm. I've dispensed medications. I conducted audiology exams, eye exams. I perform my own assessments, prescribe my own medications, and currently with my current certifications, I don't get to do all that. Mm -hmm. All right. So you're really most of the way to being a physician assistant or something on, on that level in a civilian role. Kind of. Um, we're not certified as that, and yeah. as a combat medic, the individual that allows us to work as a medic is the physician assistant. Mm -hmm. We have a physician assistant assigned to every battalion, and then on deployment, they'll assign a doctor to work with that physician. Mm -hmm. And then each brigade has a physician assigned to the brigade that the PAs answer to. Right. Okay. So there is assistant, so you're kind of one notch below the, the physician's assistants within yes, that sir. system. Okay. Now, did you have to do additional training beyond that first round at Fort Sam Houston to be able to do the other things? Um, or did that just come along the way? A lot of things came along the way. Uh, some of it was deployment training. Mm -hmm. I, the, um, there was a lot of things I learned along the way that some medics don't get taught. I got a lot of hands-on experience that I've explained to other medics how to do that they didn't know we were allowed to. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so once you complete the training at Fort Sam Houston, uh, what's your, where do you go next? I returned back here to Grand Rapids to the uh, right, Grand Valley guard. Armory. In the guard. Okay. I, I graduated in March of 98 from AIT. Mm -hmm. And I remained with the 126 Infantry until about October of 98. Okay. During that time, I did spend my two weeks of annual training. And I was able to assist the uh, combat engineers with the disaster cleanup in Gaylord after they had a huge windstorm mm -hmm. roll through there. Okay. All right. Uh, and now, uh, but from there, do you go on to active duty? In October 98, um, I realized around that time frame, I, I didn't have a civilian job. I didn't have much of an education. So I went and discussed it with my father and said, maybe it's time I go on active duty. And mm -hmm. He thought that was a good idea. However, he told me this the whole way through, if I don't want to do it, he felt he did enough time for the both of us. But he would support me with any branch I wanted to do but the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. All right, I guess some prejudices die hard. Yes. Okay. All right, uh, so you go back in um, in October. So where do you go, what do you do? I went to uh, Fort Drum, New York. Initially, I was assigned to a Charlie Company Ford Support Battalion. I never got to see that unit. From there, they attached me to uh, Headquarters Company 2nd Battalion, 87th Infantry, as a light infantry medic. Mm -hmm. I worked both the ambulance section and as a light infantry medic on the ground with the troops. All right. Now, were you part of a larger division at that point? Uh, 287, I, 
is one of the battalions that was assi is assigned to 10th Mountain Division. Right. Right, and Fort Drum was their base at that point. Yes, sir. Okay, all right. Uh, now, and how long did you stay with that unit? I was there from 1998 to 2002. Okay. While I was with them, I spent six months in Bosnia at Camp McGovern and a few places around there, but Camp McGovern was our main headquarters. I, I also spent six months in Sinai, Egypt, as a part of the Multinational Force and Observers, which is a peacekeeping mission that's based out of Rome. Mm -hmm. All right, let's deal with the Bosnian uh, trip first. So how long had you been in the unit before you deployed to Bosnia? Six to eight months, I think. Okay. I don't quite recall. All right, and what sort of preparation did you have for heading to Bosnia, or what information did you get before you went? Um, they took us to uh, the Joint Readiness Training Center down in Port Polk, Louisiana for about, a, I think, about a month of training to get us ready for it. Mm -hmm. All right, and what did that training consist of? Uh, they put us on a camp-style setting. Uh, we ran an aid station, and we set up our ambulances out there for evacuation. Uh, while the infantry went out and did their missions. At that time, I was working with the ambulance section, so I stayed with the aid station the whole time in case I was needed to drive the ambulance out to go pick up a wounded soldier from a medic on, out in the field. Okay, what kind of vehicles were they using for ambulances? I, we were using the M997 Field Light Ambulance, which is a variant of the Humvee. Okay. We could take four litter casualties, uh, eight ambulatory, or a combination of two litter and four ambulatory. Right. Okay, and what was the nature of the mission in Bosnia? Bosnia was a peacekeeping mission to, for the um, between the, I think the, um, between the Bosnians and well, the Serbs were the yes, ones the making Serbs, most of the trouble. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Now, at that point, um, had the violence toned down because there had been some very ugly stuff going on in Bosnia earlier, and initially UN peacekeepers weren't always accomplishing a lot. Yes. What was the situation by the time you got there? I was initially kind of worried uh, because at the same time, we were sending troops into Kosovo, mm -hmm. neighboring country, and I was worried about how uh, the neighboring countries politics would play into how we were uh, performing our mission in Bosnia. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a relatively calm mission. I never saw any incidents while I was out there. Uh, we performed a lot of, uh, well, we did some uh, presence patrols, a lot of security on different camps. Uh, my uh, platoon, we actually went out and with the local populace, we played some soccer games with the local kids, mm -hmm. went to a wedding, uh, stuff like that to work with the uh, local nationals. Uh, as everything was calming down, we actually had a neighboring uh, battalion from 10th Mountain that deployed with us. Mm -hmm. They got sent home three months into the deployment as we were drawing down from Bosnia. Okay. All right. Uh, and did the Bosnians at that point have any of their own security forces or people that you worked with at all? I primarily worked with uh, American troops at the time other than uh, working with interpreters that were assigned to us. Okay, and so the, and the relationship between you and the local civilians sounds like it was pretty good? It was. Okay, at that point had the Serbs mostly just left and so it was the Bosnians that were I'm not here. really sure because I didn't, while I did some presence patrols, I didn't really interact with the, personally interact mm -hmm. with the public that much. I, a lot of times they would have me driving so I'd have to remain with the vehicle mm -hmm. and that way if needed I'm in a central spot and I can get out to where the soldier was pretty quick if I needed to. Okay. And were there, did you have accidents to deal with or other things like that if there's not Actually, for Bosnia, I had no issues there. Mm -hmm. I, um, 
while I ran some of my own smaller sites where I was the only medic, uh, if I needed anything, we were very close to a larger camp and I could get them in, but I had no injuries there that I ever had to attend to. Okay. Uh, so you're just kind of, in a way, you get a chance to kind of learn the system without major crisis happening yes. to you at that particular point. Okay. Uh, so you said that was about a six-month deployment? It was a six-month deployment. Okay. Uh, and then do you go back at that point to Fort Drum? I did. Uh, I think we spent about a year back at Fort Drum it, before they decided to send us to the Sinai, Egypt for a peacekeeping mission that was there since 1980 as a buffer zone between Egypt and Israel. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and do you have a sense of where you were in that region? I mean, were you kind of the north end of Sinai or in the middle of the desert or south? I, while the um, American units cover pretty much all of Sinai, mm -hmm. uh, my battalion, uh, when I was still with uh, the infantry unit, covered the southern sector. Mm -hmm. I, and then the northern sector was covered by Fijians and Colombians. Mm -hmm. And then we had a support battalion that co uh, took care of every unit in the Sinai mm -hmm. between medical, any sort of logistic support that they might need, and aviation support. Okay. All right. Uh, and how long were you there? I did about six months there. I was there, actually, I was there for September 11th. And we got most of our information about the attacks on the World Trade Center from CNN on the uh, Armed Forces Network. Okay, yeah. So what kind of camp facility do you have out there in the Sinai at that point? When September 11th happened, we were at a checkpoint out in the middle of the desert off of uh, uh, one of their major highways. Uh, we would keep one person in the tower at all times and a couple people in our little operations center. I I did a little bit of both that I had a small little aid station that I was the only medic for mm -hmm. and I would cover I would take care of about 12 soldiers out on site as well as a couple of site dogs that was assigned to the site all right uh, what did the dogs do the dogs did whatever they wanted I they got fed from us table scraps and um, we couldn't stop it, but they also went out and terrorized the uh, local Bedouins and enjoyed uh, their goats. Oh, so you don't have the dogs on leashes? No. I, the dogs were very adept at getting off the camp and going wherever they wanted. So I, as they were dogs that were a part of the site, they didn't travel with us when we left the site back to the main camp. They just stayed out there the whole time. Why were they there at all? I kind of as an alert, uh, early warning system to let us know if there's an issue on the camp because other than American soldiers, the ones assigned to the little campsites, they didn't like anybody else coming on. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it wasn't like they had, they weren't like drug sniffers or explosive no. sniffers or anything like that. No, they were dogs that were kind of adopted uh, there in Egypt and okay. kept on the site. All right. Okay. So they're not really officially commissioned American dogs. No, they're not. No. Okay. They, they just adopted you. Okay. Um, now, did you see much of the local Bedouin? We did a little bit. I. We actually had an Egyptian uh, police checkpoint just down the road mm -hmm. that um, our support battalion would not only when they come out to support us, they would actually supply that checkpoint down the road as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and what were relations between the Americans and Egyptians like at that point? Uh, fairly well. I, at the time when September 11th happened, of course, my thoughts were, we're here in a Muslim environment. I, if I was in the guard tower, it didn't matter who came on my camp. I was, I made sure to cover the soldier that went outside the gate to search anybody that came in mm -hmm. a, in case something happened to protect him. Uh, and then as things calmed down, we were allowed to get out of our helmets and our flak vests and go back to um, regular security operations. And I didn't have to really keep as close of an eye on the person going outside the gate if I was in the tower. Okay. 
So how long did things stay tense there? I we were um right up until the time we left, I we were still a, a little more tense. The unit that was actually supposed to come relieve us uh, was from 101st Airborne. They got diverted to Afghanistan at the mm -hmm. time for uh, missions out there. So they had to train up a unit from the Arkansas National Guard to come replace us. And they kept telling us, well, because of the training, it, you may be here longer. And they kept pushing back the dates. Eventually, Arkansas National Guard got their training done on time and relieved us on time. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, and then, so th now when is it, I say that's, was that now in 2002 or was it still end of 2001? We were in 2001 I, when we returned back to Fort Drum. Okay. I, I remained at Fort Drum until about 2002 time frame, and then I went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Okay. Now, when you initially enlisted, was that going to be for four years active or what was? Four that? years active. Okay. And so you're kind of heading toward the end of that. So do you re-enlist at some point in here? I did. Okay. I, I requested Fort Sill. Um, I, w I wanted to get away from 10th Mountain because we spent a lot of field time and deployment time. I, usually if we went to the field, it was for about two weeks at a time. I didn't see any buildings, no vehicles. If I was with the uh, infantry platoon, we slept on the ground everywhere we went. We carried everything with us. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I was just wanting to get out of the field and into something that I wouldn't spend as much field time. So I thought about Fort Sill. I said, maybe that would be the place to go. Okay, well, why Fort Sill? I don't know, really know why I chose it. It was just away from Fort Drum. Okay, all right. Now, uh, Fort Sill traditionally was an artillery training facility. It is. So when I got to Fort Sill, I got assigned to 3rd Battalion, 13th Field Artillery. Don't remember which brigade that was. It turned out my dad used to wear the same regimental crest. Mm -hmm. He was, for a while, a part of 1st Battalion, 13th Field Artillery. So it was nice being able to be assigned to one of the same regiments that he was. Uh, 3rd Battalion, 13th Field Artillery was a multiple launch rocket unit. Uh, it's the only weapon system in the U.S. Army that can destroy an entire grid square if we wanted to. And so that's like a kilometer square or is it yes. larger? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, so you have firepower. All right. Um, and Basically, now were you just, just living on base in the barracks? Um. Well, uh, I actually got married uh, February 2002, right before we went to Fort Sill. Okay. So initially, we lived off post. Uh, we found uh, a house that we were running off post. I, I was assigned as one of the medics in the aid station. Mm -hmm. So at different times, I would drive the ambulance or I might be working in the aid station depending on what was needed. Mm -hmm. um, during, during that time, well, while I was there in 2003, we started all the deployments to Iraq. Mm -hmm. They deployed the majority of the units on Fort Sill for support operations in Iraq. They brought in National Guard, and at the time I was expecting my first child. He was born in May of 2013. So my leadership made a decision to keep me behind and help support all the National Guard units that were rotating through for training, mm -hmm. getting ready for deployment to Iraq. I was one of two medics left as behind to support everybody. So that meant I had to work the um, troop medical clinic, which we were co-located with the emergency room at the uh, post hospital. Mm -hmm. The senior medic worked the front desk. He checked in all the patients, and I would do all the vitals. We saw about 250 patients in the span of a few hours. The physician assistants would see all their own patients, do all their own care. 
I did all the vitals. Um, it's supposed to provide privacy for everybody as they get medical care, but as there were so many uh, soldiers looking for care, I would sit them all down in a room, walk through, put a blood pressure cuff on uh, one person, start the machine, walk down the road, keep putting on a cuff, come back, put a thermometer probe in their mouth, walk down the line, repeat the process with everybody else, write everything down, and give all the notes that I just uh, took on each uh, soldier to on a stack for the PAs to take care of. And they took care of all the care from there. And we saw them all in the span of two to three hours. So why were there so many of them? I, because National Guard is only one week and a month, two weeks a year, a mm -hmm. lot of them wanted to get seen for a lot of their stuff before they deployed okay. to make sure they got some of the care that they needed as it was being provided for free at that time. All right. So in a way, you were basically looking at whatever kind of condition they might have brought in with them or thought they might have. So kind of. I only did the vitals. Yeah. I Usually a medic is going to ask the questions about what's going on, mm -hmm. and they will go to the physician assistant, tell them, okay, I've got this patient here, these are the vitals, and this is what they have going on. Mm -hmm. But as we had so many people, I couldn't do that. All I could do is take the vitals and let the physician assistant do all their own care and ask all the questions themselves. Okay. Now, was this something that just happened once, or was it now a regular occurrence while you were there? This was a regular occurrence until uh, units started coming back. Mm -hmm. um, so I remained there until about 2004. Mm -hmm. I, I don't recall how long I was one of few medics left on the post, but I eventually got promoted to corporal at this point because I was managing the section without any uh, NCOs. Mm -hmm. And I was providing regular updates on all the soldiers in the battalion. So the uh, battalion leadership felt, okay, maybe it's time we make him an NCO since he's doing all this work for us. Okay, uh, so promotion then traditionally is pretty slow unless maybe you're in a actively involved in combat or something like that? Up until then, um, I really didn't want to get promoted. Uh, eventually, it got to a point where my first sergeant said, you're going to the board. You mm -hmm. don't have an option. Yeah. So with me making that promotable status, they sent me to the uh, primary leadership development course to learn how to become an NCO. Mm -hmm. And they worked with me to get me there. Uh, originally, I came into the Army with asthma, and I had people telling me I couldn't get in the Army because of it. Mm -hmm. And recruiters didn't want to work with me. I had to prove I could handle the training to get waivers to come in. Mm -hmm. And when I was at Fort Still, I started having more and more issues with my asthma. So eventually they put me on a run home pace and distance. And my leadership started working with me to ensure I would pass a PT test mm -hmm. so I could go to the, um, that course to get promoted. Right. The leadership was great about working with me. Uh, they said, this is your time to go uh, get promoted. You're going to go. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and then the actual training course itself, where did they do that? And I, The um, primary leadership development course I uh, was actually taught on Fort Sill. Okay. For, uh, um, most installations will have, uh, now it's called Warrior well, it transferred the warrior leader course and they changed the name to the primary leadership course again. Mm -hmm. But it's basically the same thing. I, we teach the same, same things as being uh, a basic NCO mm -hmm. and what to do. I, it was taught there in Fort Sill. And in fact, during this time, I got to support I, that um, NCO Academy as well as I, new officers coming in learning to become artillery officers into the Army. I got to go out and support some of their field exercises. Okay, so you're still working as a medic in effect for those things even yes. as you're training yep. and, and doing all of that. Okay, um, so when do you then become a corporal? I, 
I don't recall per se when I became a corporal, just that it happened when I was at Fort Sill. Mm -hmm. um, and just because of the amount of duties I started picking up and the amount of reports I was doing on the whole battalion of soldiers, that's why they decided it's time to make me a corporal because mm -hmm. I was regularly in front of the battalion commander and the battalion sergeant major mm -hmm. making these reports as to the readiness of their soldiers. Right. Okay. So you were doing the corporal's job all along and then at some point you officially get the rank? Yes. Okay. Uh, and so how long then do you stay at Fort Sill? I stayed at Fort Sill until about 2004. Okay. And then I re had re-enlisted during that time. I wanted station of choice and they said, well, that's not really an option for you because it's no longer your first enlistment. Mm -hmm. I said, well, you know what? You always need soldiers to go to Korea and uh, I'll be happy to go to Korea if you send me where I want to go next. And my wife at the time had family at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. So mm -hmm. I said, send me to Korea with return to Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And the Army was willing to grant that request. So I went and spent a year in uh, Camp Casey, Korea and Camp Hovey uh, near Dongducheon, up near the DMZ. Okay. All right. And what units were you with or what duties did you have there? I was assigned to... 1st Battalion, 15th Field Artillery to their headquarters, headquarters battery. Mm -hmm. I, I worked out of their uh, troop medical clinic, was a, which was a combined troop clinic for that and a few other uh, units. I helped with their pharmacy and, of course, regular medic duties as far as uh, screening patients and getting them presented to the physician assistant. I, when we go to the field, they'd assign me to the service battery, which they provided all the cooks. Uh, they were the ones that would transport all the ammunition. This unit was a Paladin unit, so it was self-propelled artillery. Uh, it mounted a 155 uh, gun on there, mm -hmm. and the service battery would transport all the ammunition for those guns. Uh, my job, I was the only medic for the battery, which is about a company size element. And they would find a place to set up a camp and they would work out of the camp. I trained my personnel in that company. I set up uh, my own uh, casualty collection point next to where the operations center was. Then I would set up aid and litter teams with uh, personnel that could treat out on a, a different area of the uh, camp. They would go out, treat the soldier, bring them back to me in the uh, casualty collection point. And I would have personnel trained there that could uh, oversee the patients. I would come by, check on what they had going on, make my recommendation if they need to do anything else, mm -hmm. keep track of uh, what patients were there. And uh, if I needed evacuation, I would let the operations center know this is what I have. We need to evacuate them. One, one of the interesting things I had done was at one time combat medics would, whenever you called out medic, the medic would run out and pick up that soldier and bring him back to an area of uh, safety. Mm -hmm. During this time, I started training them that I'm the only medic out there. Bring the casualty to me and I will treat them from there. I was trying to tell them that because being the only medic, if something happens, then they don't have uh, somebody else to take care of them. Mm -hmm. If I can treat uh, combat lifesavers to do that treatment and bring them to me, they're still going to get the further care that they need. The company first sergeant was uh, under that old school train of thought that if there's a soldier down, the medic needs to go to them. I tried to tell the first sergeant, I don't do that send one of the combat lifesavers out. They will bring them to me. Oh no, we got a soldier down. You need to go out there. Okay. I went with his recommendation. I went out there and thinking it was a wounded soldier I came across, I did a log roll, rolled him on his side, and there was a grenade, uh, simulated grenade under that patient. So their medic now became a casualty. Mm -hmm. 
And the observing commander asked me afterward, why did you go outside the wire? Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, the first sergeant told me to. And he's like, you are not supposed to go out. You're the only medic for this battery. Well, I had to comply with what the first sergeant said. And they told me, you don't ever go back out there again. Well, that was a lesson learned for the first sergeant. Mm -hmm. Okay, sometimes the medic has a good point and you need to listen to the medic mm -hmm. that um, they're not supposed to do something. And the first sergeant had a good lesson learned. All right. Uh, how did you get along with the first sergeant otherwise? The first sergeant I uh, got along, uh, it was actually the company XO that worked with me the most and was really trying to get me promoted while I was there in Korea. Mm -hmm. I, while I was in Korea, I was having even more problems with my physical fitness. Mm -hmm. And because of my asthma, I started failing physical fitness tests. Okay. So I got recommended for a medical evaluation board for possible separation from the military. Mm -hmm. I had to go down to 121 General Hospital in Seoul and see a, an internal medicine uh, doctor for his recommendation. They had to make a recommendation whether I could stay or go. He asked me some questions, asked if I wanted to stay in. I said, well, I actually enjoy what I'm doing. I want to stay here. Well, if you can pass it, we will make your alternate event. You will walk the PT test. I said, okay, I'm willing to do that. I went back to my unit. My unit was a little upset. They wanted me, wanted to med board me out of the military. Well, I passed the physical fitness test and they had to keep me. During that time, uh, because I failed my physical fitness test, I ended up getting flagged and they removed my corporal from me. During this time, I was still signing my promotion points worksheet that I had points. And as soon as the flag came off because I passed my PT test, I said, well, I've got points to make promotion. I want my promotion backdated to when I was supposed to make rank. And the unit said, oh, no, we're not going to do that. You were flagged for a reason. You're not going to get promoted. A short time later, I came up on the automatic uh, promotion list and ended up with my promotion status back again. And at this point, because this was per the Army and not per the unit, they had to make me promotable again. I didn't have points to make promotion, but I was promotable again. Mm -hmm. So I left Korea being a specialist again. Uh, I departed in, I think, 2005 to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, which was supposed to be my follow-on assignment. Mm -hmm. Fort Bragg is home of uh, the Airborne. Mm -hmm. At this point, I'm a walker. They needed medics pretty badly in uh, 27th Engineer Battalion, which is an airborne unit that supports 18th Airborne Corps. Well, because I'm a walker, I could not go to airborne school. I was considered a leg in an airborne unit, but they needed me pretty badly, so okay. the Sergeant Major asked for my assistance. Okay. So just explain for an outside audience, you talk about being a leg or a walker and so forth, what does that mean? So. Because I was a walker on the PT <coughs> test, I walked instead of ran. Okay. I, you have to run to go to airborne school. Being a walker, that excluded me from airborne school. And when you're in an airborne unit, they want everybody to be airborne qualified. Right. If you are not airborne, you're considered a leg and you're looked down upon. Mm -hmm. I, I actually enjoyed this unit. I feel it was the best unit I was in in the Army. I, I had some great support out of them, and I um, have met soldiers since uh, in different places that were a part of that unit, and I'm like, hey, I used to be with that unit. And so they would tell me the changes that happened over the years since I left them. Mm -hmm. Now, is this part of the 82nd Airborne, or was it just the Corps headquarters? Or It was a part of uh, 20th uh, Engineer Brigade. Okay which 20th Engineer Brigade supports 18th Airborne Corps. Okay. And 18th Airborne Corps is units like 101st, 82nd yeah. uh, Airborne Division, 
Tenth Mountain, and I think the unit out of Fort Stewart, which is, I think, second, I uh, not second, uh, maybe it's fourth infantry division, I'm not sure. Okay. I, ne I was never down there. All right, okay. Yeah, so you're basically a core level uh, assignment yes. there. Okay, you're based there. All right, uh, and what did your duties uh, at Fort Bragg consist of? Well, I was I assigned to their aid station with the headquarters and headquarters company. I supported all the companies. Uh, interesting thing about 27th Engineers is they have the only active rough terrain unit in the Army. Rough terrain is where they, um, like smoke jumpers, they put on extra padding, a caged uh, helmet, and they jump into the trees. This is, uh, other units will train for that as a secondary duty, but this is the only unit that has the primary duty of doing it. Um, as I was not able to go airborne, I covered all their uh, airborne jumps. They had to have a medic on site. So I would drive the ambulance out to their site for their, um, their jumps. Uh, anytime they conducted a firing range or explosives, uh, medic had to be on site. Um, I, t uh, 27th Engineers, while I was with them, they deployed to Afghanistan. I was the medic with the most experience, most, jun most senior junior medic with mm -hmm. the most experience. So the day following hitting the ground in Afghanistan, they pushed me out to sector right away to support a, a platoon that was already on the ground conducting route clearance missions, which was making sure the roads were clear of mines and I, uh, improvised explosive de devices. Okay. Most of the medics went through a quick train up and an indoctrination period, but the platoon that was already on the ground actually um, was hit during an ambush while we were en route to Afghanistan. So they said, we want you out there to take care of them. Uh, I primarily did route clearance missions with them. I eventually, what I started doing is I started volunteer work. When they would conduct their maintenance on their vehicles, I would go up to the forward surgical team or the combat support hospital, depending where, where I was at, and spend time with them learning how to be a better medic. Mm -hmm. In doing so, the forward surgical team in the combat support hospital have actual surgeons assigned to them. Being said, I was a volunteer, they said, you know what, we want some help doing surgery. You need to scrub in, you're gonna assist us. The, with the forward surgical team, I was able to assist in a stump revision for a leg amputation for a US service member and then another service member came in and he needed a chest tube and have his uh, um, whole abdominal cavity examined. So I got to assist with that, which was interesting. Most medics don't get to do this. I, and then when I got to the combat support hospital on a different camp, I was mostly assisting with post-surgical care after they came out of surgery, I would they would come back in on an outpatient basis and I would make sure the wounds are clean. Mm -hmm. We started offering a uh, burn clinic, which per Army standard, after a certain percentage of burns, we were supposed to turn them away. In the States, the burns that we were taking care of would be actually admitted into the hospital and taken care of there. Mm -hmm. And we were doing it on an outpatient basis, seeing them on a daily, daily and taking care of their wounds and making sure they had a better quality of life. Um, because I was doing this work in the hospital, I was able to assist a orthopedic surgeon and um, she let me jump in on two ankle reconstruction surgeries and I did 98% of the work. She would guide me and um, watch what I was doing uh, on a, it's similar to an x-ray machine, it was a C-arm, and she would tell me uh, to continue drilling into the bone. 
then uh, she would initially put in a wire and over this wire I'd put the drill bit, drill into the bone, she would tell me when to stop, then she'd hand me a screwdriver and have me put the screws into the bone to uh, fix those ankles uh, that were had some pretty bad fractures. I did one on a left ankle and one on the right ankle. I've never gotten to experience that again where I've been able to do the work by myself. Mm -hmm. All right. <coughs> I want to back up a little bit here. You get how much advance word did you have you're going to Afghanistan? I uh, I found out as soon as I arrived with 27th engineers that mm -hmm. we were going to be departing right away. Okay. I was supposed to actually go to my sister's wedding and their wedding happened when I was on the flight to Afghanistan. So the nice touch they had to it was they asked me to be a groomsman. They put in the uh, bulletin that I was a groomsman, but I ended up having to be deployed to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, many of the things I did in Afghanistan, as far as working in the free clinics, eventually I had, people had to fill me in on what I was doing and the bigger picture of things that I was doing. I, on September 11th, I think 2008, we had a um, huge funeral go through. The day prior, the governor of the province of um, the camp we were, or we were in, I don't remember the name of the camp, but I, oh, it was on s uh, outside of Salerno. So the major city outside of it was Coast, uh, Coast, mm -hmm. K-H-O-S-T. Yep. I, a suicide bomber had killed the governor the day, the day prior to September 11th. Mm -hmm. They had a huge funeral uh, the following day, well over 250 people. I, another suicide bomber, a 12-year-old child, um, walked into the crowd of um, mourners and set off his suicide vest. All these people came to um, Camp Salerno for their treatment since we had a combat support hospital mm -hmm. there. I didn't see the big picture. I saw the few people I took care of. And somebody later on told me how big the event really was that at least 250 people were injured during this uh, attack. Um, the unit I was with on Salerno, not only we had one section that made sure the roads were cleared, but we had another one that built roads. I su primarily supported them building the roads out to some of these outlying camps, which were usually for the border patrol to support them. And we also had a small section that went through made sure uh, we made wells for local communities. And since September 11th, uh, 2001, while we were in Afghanistan, one of the big things we started doing was building local girls' schools. Mm -hmm. So girls were allowed to go to school and receive an education. Prior to us coming in, girls were not allowed to get an education. and. To me, that was a big thing that we were doing was mm -hmm. building schools so they can get educated. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so, I mean, to go back again to where I, I a question that I asked. So, so, really, you didn't get a whole lot of actual preparation before going to Afghanistan. No, I didn't. So they're not really teaching you much about what the situation is, or um, for that one, other than the trainups we did on Fort Bragg. That, that was all we did. Mm -hmm. Before I went to, I, I forgot to mention, before I went to Egypt, they sent me to the National Training Center. Um, so Afghanistan, I didn't have the actual train up. When mm -hmm. I returned, we lost a number of our NCOs or they were away for school. So again, I was the, I, I ended up getting promoted while I was in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Um, after working with all the units there, uh, one of the things I re-enlisted for was a school option. So I got to go to school full time while I was assigned there to Fort Bragg. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so for a little bit, I was the senior medic there as an E5, uh, a brand new sergeant mm -hmm. running the section until we got more leadership in. Um, one of my notable missions, I got to work with New Zealanders. Our engineers were tasked to find a route from uh, the main camp, I can't remember the main camp's name, it's the largest camp in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. to the forward operating base for the New Zealanders. Uh, and it was, we called it a snow and ice removal mission. We wanted to see if we had to do, I in an emergency, could we get to their camp and be able to support them. So they mounted a snow plow in the front of a five ton. I had just gotten back from my uh, two weeks of R&R. &R. When I left, it was 80 degrees out. When I came back, there was an ice storm and heavy snow on the ground. It was still snowing heavily out. So I didn't have the gear I needed. And I went to this other camp. I eventually had to pull out a space blanket to try to keep warm. I got out there, and one of the first things I did uh, any time I went to a new camp is I went to seek out where the aid station was in case I needed help. So, of course, I went out there. I met up with the New Zealand medics, and they were great to work with me. One of my interpreters was like, I need a hat to wear out here. It's too cold. So I went to them. I'm like, my interpreter needs a hat. And they're like, oh, we can take care of it. And working with them I was interesting, uh, especially with the differences in the English that we speak. At one point, they came around and asked me if I wanted to brew, and I kept asking them to repeat themselves. I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to ask you again. What? And then I finally said, okay, explain to you, me what you mean by brew. And they said, would you like me to brew you some coffee? I'm like, oh, yes, please, I'll take some coffee. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm sorry. I thought you were asking me if I wanted a brew as in a beer. Mm -hmm. And they all started laughing and started talking about beer at that point. So it was funny working with them and our language barrier, kind of, mm -hmm. per se. Okay. Now you also mentioned interpreters. You have an Afghan interpreter who was yes. assigned to you? Yep. Okay. I, even in the uh, combat support hospital, we had interpreters assigned to us. I, this was my first time in the hospital learning that to take care of a woman, you cannot talk to them directly. Mm -hmm. You have to work through a male family member whether it's the husband, a brother, or mm -hmm. son. Right. And you have to talk directly to them to get your answers. Mm -hmm. So were you treating a lot of Afghans in the places you went? I did. I, I went out and supported a few uh, medical assistance missions. I, the surgical clinics I supported uh, was mainly local nationals, especially children. I did a lot of work mm -hmm. with children. I, because it, we were doing these free clinics, it actually helped us out in the long run whenever the Taliban would try to attack U.S. forces, sometimes the village elders would come to us and say, hey, there's actually an attack planned at this point in the road. You may not want to avoid it. And uh, sometimes that information would turn out to be true. So it was a great help to us. Did you have a sense at all while you were there of whether or not we were sort of making progress in Afghanistan? I felt like we were, but at the same time, I was worried that um, the moment we pull out, things would go back to the same, same way mm -hmm. as it was. Um, so this, of course, was my first trip to Afghanistan. I enjoyed everything I was doing, taking care of the local nationals, uh, providing them free care, making sure s kids got their education, building roads for them to improve their quality of life.
And I felt that was an important role that we were doing was taking care of people and making things better for them. All right. Are there other particular memories you have of that tour in Afghanistan that you want to bring into the story that you haven't yet? Um, it's funny because I was an engineer medic this first tour. I did see a little bit of combat, but when I was under fire, I didn't. I never took care of a U.S. soldier, so I never got my combat medic's badge or a combat action badge, mm -hmm. which during my first deployment kind of upset me that I didn't get it. But as I got to the end of my deployment, I was my attitude changed to, if I got a combat medic's badge, that means something happened on my deployment. Mm -hmm. Somebody is coming back injured or possibly killed. Mm -hmm. If all my troops have come back in one piece and alive, then I did my job. Mm -hmm. A combat medic's badge no longer mattered to me. But a combat medic's badge, it's sought for by medics to show that you did your job under fire. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's disappointing I didn't get it, but my ultimate goal was everybody came home, mm -hmm. everybody came back in one piece, and I didn't have any injuries. All right. So when do you get back from Afghanistan? I got back in 2008. I started looking where I could go next. I started noticing assignments open for Alaska. And at the time, I was also receiving allergy shots um, because I had a lot of allergies. And I went to my allergist and said, how far north do I have to go that I no longer need to receive allergy shots or have issues with my allergies. Oh, you probably need to go to Alaska. I'm like, oh good, because that's where I'm gonna go next. I went to Fort Wainwright, Alaska, outside of Fairbanks, and was assigned to the Ford Support Medical Company uh, in the Brigade Support Battalion, uh, supporting the entire brigade. Uh, the brigade was first, uh, First Striker Brigade, 25th ID. That's 25th, Division. 25th ID at this point had units not only in uh, Hawaii, but they had a Striker Brigade at Fort Wainwright and an Airborne Brigade at uh, Fort Richardson, Alaska. Um, when I was at Fort Wainwright, I got to do a little bit of everything. Um, I worked uh, in the ambulance section for quite a while, and then I also worked in the uh, aid station for quite a bit too, getting, getting experience in a company level aid station, which <coughs> not just had the medics, the PAs, and the surgeon. We also had x-ray, lab, physical therapy, dental, uh, mental health support. I, a supply section and a headquarters section. Um, I get to spend a lot of time in the field supporting other units uh, in the brigade so they could go to like their expert infantryman's badge at Fort Greeley. I at one point had no clue about the facilities at Fort Greeley or even uh, sometimes we'd send units out to uh, I want to say Ileson Air Force Base at, at North Pole, Alaska nearby. And as I didn't know the facilities or the procedures for evacuating a soldier out there, I went out in advance, starting finding out the local sources for where their medical treatment facility was, where any injuries are gonna go to, and if I have to fly somebody out, where would I go? I So I set all this up put a presentation together, a book, so all my medics in the platoon would know where to go, how to get that support they needed. Um, at one point, I, they had me put a convoy together to Fort Greeley, and we could only have so many vehicles max in the convoy, so I had to learn, okay, it's just not medical personnel going. I've got a fueler going this time from another company. How do I work all this in? 
oh, they've got to make stops at certain points. I can only have so many vehicles in the convoy, so we're going to, uh, I had to set it up for two separate convoys because I had too many vehicles and get them from Fort Wainwright, Alaska to Fort Greeley for the exercise. How far away was Fort Greeley? Fort Greeley is about two and a half hours from my, two and a half to three hours from Fort Wainwright. Mm -hmm. They have a larger training area out there. It's more remote. Uh, Fort Greeley actually has an active duty space missile battalion for the National Guard. Uh, that's all they do is support that uh, space missile site. Mm -hmm. uh, so I found they had a small aid station there, met up with their medics, and they said, oh, we also use this clinic out in town for the families in any emergencies. Mm -hmm. So you'll want to go visit with them and find out what they have and how to evacuate from there if care is needed. I. Uh, Fort Greeley, we conducted an EIB, and at Fort Wainwright, we conducted uh, an expert medic field medic badge. Um, I didn't do that, but they asked me to help run the operations center. During this time, I um, put a database together of all the candidates that were going through. For every task they had to complete, I put in the letters uh, N, or G for no go or go. If it was a go, the, their name was green. If it was a no go, the block would turn red. And after so many red blocks, it would turn, the whole line would turn red, meaning the candidate got dropped from the, uh, the competition. This was so well liked by the um, evaluators that came from Fort Sam Houston to evaluate the competition that they wanted to take this tweak it and send it army wide so they asked me for a copy of it mm -hmm. eventually because of this work I was doing um, later on I uh, it got me into the brigade talk but before that point uh, they deployed us they sent us to um, Fort Irwin California for the National Training Center to send us to Iraq we went to FOB Warhorse Iraq uh, FOB is a forward operating forward base. Forward operating base. As I was in the um, brigade medical company, they put us on a main camp with a bunch of smaller areas that um, got support from it. I got there. I was assigned to, we had a spa, what's called a spa war cafe. The Navy has something called the Space Warfare Command. Mm -hmm. And what they try to do for troops, no matter which branch, is provide internet and phone capability. Uh, because of my knowledge of computers, they said, guess what, you're gonna run this internet cafe. I'm like, I really don't wanna do that. And they said, well, <laughs> you don't have a choice. You're gonna run it for everybody in the battalion and anybody else that wants to come through. So I had to maintain all the computers, the phones, and made sure everything ran smoothly in there. When I wasn't in there, I was helping to run the ambulance section. And I, we had regular um, exercises for mass casualty events on the camp. I, we started finding out that our litters didn't work with all the evacuation assets. So I started putting it together a presentation for our commander to say, hey, we can use this stretcher on this vehicle, this vehicle, but we can't use it on these vehicles. We can't use this stretcher at all. So that helped us to learn where we could position certain types of stretchers for, for evacuating a casualty to get them to the aid station and what stretchers could go on our minor resistant ambulances mm -hmm. and which ones could go on the helicopters. So that better enabled the commander to know which stretcher to purchase to put the casualty on to for uh, the assets that we had available. Okay. Uh, and I had to do my research to which one we could put on. And I took pictures of everything, pictures of the vehicles, the stretchers, and which stretchers could go to which vehicle. So running the internet cafe wasn't the only thing you were doing? Then. No. Uh, okay. 
When did you actually go to Iraq? Uh, we went from 2008 to 2009. Okay. So you weren't in Alaska really all that long then? No. Okay. Now, were you there during the summer or winter or? I got there in May 2008, okay. and by winter we were deployed to Iraq. Um, interesting thing is they give us a lot of um, hands-on training before deployment, which I felt the hands-on training was very beneficial mm -hmm. that a lot of medical personnel don't get, and it helped us to better prepare us for deployment at this point. I So but going to Af Iraq, I really, I, again, I didn't deal with any patients on my own. Mm -hmm. When I did, it was usually transporting a patient. It, it, when we did have a real world patient, it was transporting from them from our camp to the combat support hospital on the air base, mm -hmm. getting them ready for evacuation. So again, I had an uneventful uh, deployment. I saw a little bit of action but it didn't get me a combat badge again. And so what was the nature of the action you saw? Um, I supported a mission where they needed a medic to go out. I drove uh, the mine resistant ambulance on that mission. One of our lead vehicles was struck by an IED. Mm -hmm. uh, I sent my assistant uh, medic out to go do the evaluation. Everybody was fine and we went on. I, again, I didn't get a combat badge mm -hmm. for it, but my philosophy at that point was worry about my new medic here getting a combat badge. If mm -hmm. my soldiers are coming back in one piece, that's all that matters to me. Mm -hmm. uh, this time around, I didn't see as much action as my tour to Afghanistan, mm -hmm. which I was very okay with. Um, so we came back in 2009, spent a little over a year back in Fort Wainwright. At this time, I was finally able to have my family up there. I, I found a tasking for um, electronic warfare school. I said, in that tasking, it said we had to have two people qualified to run the counter IED systems for uh, radio jamming. Mm -hmm. I said, I've got the clearance for this, send me. So I got the authorization to go to learn electronic warfare. It was two weeks down at Fort Huachuca, Arizona. Mm -hmm. uh, that was an interesting experience. I've only met one other medic in my career that is electronic warfare qualified like I was. Mm -hmm. um, so duties from that, after that, I really didn't have to do much, but I was qualified to maintain all the um, jamming systems in the vehicles and teach everybody how to run them. I uh, never really had to employ those skills, mm -hmm. but it's something I have in my hip pocket now. Okay. So the basic idea of that was that you could jam the signals that would be going to set off command detonated devices yes. or things like that. Yeah. Okay. Whether it was a cell phone mm -hmm. signal, uh, a walkie-talkie, it could be something as simple <coughs> as your key fob or even a garage door opener. Mm -hmm. And these systems would make it so those signals couldn't get through to the explosive device mm -hmm. and set it off. Okay. Um, also, shortly after that time, I got selected to go to the advanced leaders course down at um, Fort Sam Houston, Texas for a few weeks. Um, I met a medic up in uh, Fort Wainwright, when I first got there, he ended up being my roommate. We're still good friends today. Mm -hmm. His name's Cy Carlos Rosado. He was uh, Sergeant E-5 like me. Uh, he helped me get promoted to E-6, taught me little things to get me to that point. Mm -hmm. I, him and I went to um, Fort Sam Houston together, both completed our training for Staff Sergeant before we returned to Alaska. He eventually got selected because of his amount of time overseas. They said, well, you've had over seven years deployment time. You're going to go to recruiting. As far as me, they said, well, we need medics on this upcoming deployment. 
you're going to stay in Alaska longer and go with us. It's like wonderful. So we went to back to Afghanistan in 2011. Before we go there, uh, talk a little bit just about living in Alaska. Because uh, now you're there kind of through the years, so you see the different seasons and yes. all that. So uh, what, what challenges did that present for a military unit, and how did your family like it? My kids loved their time out there. Before we moved to Alaska, I used to tell them, if the sun's gone down, it's time for bed. In Alaska, during the summer, you have 23 hours of daylight. So it'd be bedtime, and I'd tell my kids it's time for bed. But Dad, you said as long as the sun was up, we got to stay up. I'm like, well, it doesn't work that way up here. It's time <laughs> for bed. In the winter, you would have about 21 hours worth of night. So it took a little getting used to of the different uh, the hours for day and night. Um, we still had to conduct physical fitness in the dark. Even if there was snow and ice on the ground, they put I, um, they called it yak tracks. They, they were rubber uh, grips that were put onto the bottom of your uh, shoes to help you keep from slipping. So we would still go run out on the ice up until negative 20 in the winter. Anything over negative 20, we had to conduct our physical fitness inside. Mm -hmm. So that was a lot of fun. And of course, at this point, I was no longer running unless I really wanted to. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, I would walk. Um, at this point, I, I'm not sure if she was on the camera. We picked up my dog, Ezzy. She started out as the family pet. And she would actually go with me to physical fitness uh, fit PT formations, and she would walk with me up the hills, stand with me in formation. Um, so she started out with me doing that with, in the Army. But she started out as the family pet. Um, so later on down the road, we did uh, NTC again, getting ready for uh, deployment. Got some more medical training, advanced medical training for this deployment. At this point, they had me running the um, running aid station operations. I was usually managing the front desk. But as I was a married soldier, I um, quite often would get tasked out to go cover different field events because I was married. And um, some of the medics we had were single soldiers or they would need surgery and being married, they said, okay, you get to go do this now. So Why would it make a difference whether you're married or single? Um, really, per the Army, you're supposed to have a family care plan. So if the, the unit needs to send you to the field, they could do so. Uh, whether you're a single parent or even married in overseas, you're supposed to have a plan in case you have to go to the field or you get deployed. Uh, and then what would happen if you're in the field or deployed and something happens with the family? But being a married soldier, single parents had a little more priority when they had to be back to pick up their kids mm -hmm. at certain times. Uh, being married, they knew, okay, my wife could take care of the kids mm -hmm. and they would send me to go do the events because of that. Um, so we went to Afghanistan from 2011 to 12. My first six months, I started out in the um, aid station on Kandahar. We kept our main footprint on Kandahar for the Brigade Support Battalion and sent all the battalions out to the uh, area of operations from there. I worked tirelessly at this point on my promotion. I lost points and I said, you know what, I'm gonna get it back. So I spent a lot of hours working correspondence courses to get promoted. When I got promoted, uh, there was no E6 slots for me in the company. And the brigade looked at it and they said, you know what, we need help in the operations center. You're gonna come up here and help us out kind of upset some of the other NCOs we had that I was going to a job that was um, more admin time than what I was doing. 
but I was selected because I uh, ran the operation center for the expert field medical badge. They saw the work I was capable of and mm -hmm. said, you can come do that for us. When I went to the operation center, this was on Fab Mazengar. It was originally a camp the Canadian forces had that we took over. I, I was going to the medical operations section. My main responsibilities was to watch the chat rooms that we had up. The medic on the ground, if they had a casualty, they would make their request through their leadership, the platoon sergeant platoon leader. That platoon leader would send out either a, an electronic message or a radio request to the battalion. The battalion in turn would make that nine line medevac request, type it up and send it to me. I would have to watch out for these messages and take the messages and retransmit it to the, um, what was called uh, RC South. They controlled all the medevac requests. There were two different units. Um, one was an Army dust off unit. The uh, other helicopters. one. Helicopters? Helicopters. Yeah. The other one was called Pedro. They were an Air Force para-jumper unit that would also come in and pick up our casualties. So I would make the request to them. Sometimes they would already be watching my chats. They would call me up and say, hey, we're already getting the helicopter ready. Uh, make your request and we'll inform RC South we're going to take the mission. And if I had multiple people out there needing pickup, I would make coordination with that unit to sometimes ask them to send the helicopter to multiple locations rather than send multiple helicopters out. Mm -hmm. If I saw it was in an area that security, they needed security, I had an aviation section next to me that controlled all of the aircraft in the area, whether it was Apaches or um, fighter support, they would control all of that. So I would ask them, do you have an aircraft in the area that could support my uh, medevac? If they had one, they would divert that aircraft to go support them. My, one of my other duties was also to rep make reports up from the point of injury uh, on the battlefield site, all the way stateside, all the care that they received. This way the commander was informed on what was going on with their soldier even mm -hmm. after they got home because they were still assigned to us. Even though they were going to a wounded warrior unit, whether it's at the closest hospital that they want or closest installation they wanted to go to, some of them went to Walter Reed in uh, Bethesda, Maryland. Some of them went to um, Fort Sam Houston to Brook Army Medical Center. Some went to Fort Lewis, Washington to Madigan Army Medical Center. Any treatment they received, I followed right along in what they were getting. I did this until the end of the deployment, got home, and I started looking at where could I go next. Unfortunately, yeah, again, just before we back you up again, take you back into Afghanistan, you were talking about you know casualties and things like that. Uh, were these mostly IED casualties, or what was what were you getting? I had. Um, Mostly IED, but some of them were from ambushes. So they might have gotten shot. Mm -hmm. uh, we had some come through. For, um, they were hit with a uh, recoilless rifle on their vehicle. Mm -hmm. So they got shrapnel wounds, and we took care of them. Um, so we had a little bit of everything. I, we had one person that evacuated from the battlefield that was a double amputee. I had actually had a couple of them. Mm -hmm. uh, they ended up losing both their legs. Both of these individuals, uh, I'm happy to say they've lived. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll get into that here in a moment. Mm -hmm. from, uh, from that point, I started looking, okay, I'm at the end of my tour in Alaska. Where am I going to go next? Unfortunately, during this time, I, my family started going through a breakup and I started looking where could I go to be the closest to them and my ex-wife was from Aberdeen Maryland so I was looking where can I go closest to them and be close to the kids mm -hmm. 
one of the options that was given to me was Walter Reed National Military Medical Center and Bethesda. Uh, the, it's funny, it's on a Navy, Navy medical bay, or Navy installation, but it's a joint hospital. Mm -hmm. I got assigned to the Wounded Warrior Brigade at uh, Walter Reed. Further from there, I got sent to the Wounded Warrior Clinic. I was one of two to three medics assigned, depending on when uh, we had other medics in there, because some was from the uh, National Guard. Uh, for a short while, I managed the clinic. I was in charge of at least 12 doctors and nurses. I was in charge of their pay, uh, all their credentialing. I was in charge of joint commission inspections, which is a civilian standard to, for medical care in hospitals. I, I was in charge of safety inspections and the readiness of this clinic. We took care of both wounded warriors and their families. The two individuals I mentioned that I took care of getting them off the battlefield, mm -hmm. I didn't personally see them, but I had a huge hand in their care getting them home. These individuals ended up going to Walter Reed. They ended up, I saw them on the other end after their emergency care, after their time in the ICU. They came to their outpatient side when they were getting physical therapy and occupational therapy, getting ready to retire from the Army. Uh, both individuals survived. They are now medically retired. And um, one of them, I'm still in close contact with their family. I knew, actually knew the family before I knew he came to um, Alaska. Mm -hmm. uh, they were uh, not far from me in Fort Drum, New York. Uh, so the family has since kept in contact with me. Um, and they've looked out for me in the long run when I've needed help. Uh, the, even the patients, the soldiers I took care of, the wounded warriors, when I started needing help, one of them actually grabbed me up by the collar, shook me and said, Doc, you came straight off the battlefield into this job. You need a break. Step back, take a knee, let another medic take over. You've done your time. I, uh, so it's a good feeling that the families are all appreciative of me mm -hmm. and everybody's looked out for me. Even after I retired from the army, they're still looking out for me. And to see them on the other end doing well has been a great motivator in me doing this job. Mm -hmm. um, during this point, I started having more problems with PTSD. Mm -hmm. The Army didn't classify me as having PTSD at this time. They said I had major depressive disorder. Mm -hmm. However, my family and friends all said, you've got PTSD, go get seen. Mm -hmm. And my psychiatrist kept saying, no, you don't have it. You're just feeding into what your patients and family are saying. So it was getting to a point where physically I could no longer do my job. I, I was no longer passing physical fitness tests mm -hmm. again. I, I was overweight because of it. And I was getting to an end point in my career. I could no longer re-enlist. Mm -hmm. I got to up to 17 and a half years. And eventually I talked to my brigade sergeant major and he's like, no, you're not leaving with nothing to show for your time. You need to go back for a med board because I don't believe everything is well controlled as they're saying it is. Mm -hmm. He's like, mentally and physically, you've got a lot going on. Go get seen. During this time in the clinic, I finally found a provider that was willing to work with me. Mm -hmm. I said, sir, I've got asthma. Maybe it's time to consider using this to, for my med board. He looked over the notes, he said, yes, you do, and I will be happy to put you forth for the med board. During the med board evaluation, I, the um, Army decided I met criteria to be medically retired. Mm -hmm. I w was evaluated at 80%, both with the VA and the Army. Mm -hmm. So 
in August of 2015. I left a month early. Um, my dad actually had started teaching me before this point about scouting in the military. Mm -hmm. In Alaska, I got tasked out to go support summer camp as they wanted somebody to teach first aid and safety. And mm -hmm. then they said, we need somebody to provide medical support, and you're it. So I got in charge of that. When I was at Walter Reed, I started taking one of the lessons my dad taught me about going to do temporary duty at camp. And I actually got to go spend a week at camp as a staff member and get paid to go. So that was a lot of fun. And I got to learn something new on the scouting side to work with my scouts with. Mm -hmm. um, so I retired in August of 2015. I moved back up here, back up here to Michigan. Uh, my kids came with me. They eventually, when I went to Walter Reed, they actually relocated with me. Things mm -hmm. changed. And they came with me up here to Michigan. Since then, I've maintained my EMT certifications. I became a medical assistant I, and a pharmacy technician. Um, I got involved in... Not everybody knows about this. is something called the Michigan State Defense Force. Uh, they take prior service and it's civilians in. It's a civil civilian component of the National Guard. Mm -hmm. uh, we're all volunteers unless the governor calls us up. We do wear uniform and rank. I started out being the medical NCO for the units I was in. And eventually, because of my experience, they asked me to go do a battalion operation slot because of my time in the brigade operations uh, doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I did such a good job doing that. Um, they recently reorganized our brigade into two battalions. And I said, you know what? I want to return to Grand Rapids. I was at that point working down in Fort Custer. And they said, well, we have a master sergeant slot up there. You can go do that. Then they started talking to me. They realized I've got a lot of experience. And they said, come help us in the brigade talk with your experience. Come run that for us. Last weekend, I went to a drill in Grayling. And I was very surprised. I was welcomed in. It wasn't even my company. They said, come in. We want your opinion on how to do things. And th I was starting to question, being questioned by their, their first sergeant is actually a sergeant, E5. Mm -hmm. And here I'm a master sergeant, so I'm a few ranks above him. And he's like, why aren't you doing my job? I'm like, to be honest, I don't want your job. <laughs> I have a lot of influence in what I'm doing already. But I'm happy to come up and assist you with your drills and teach you guys what to do. So I'm glad I'm making, still making a huge influence on soldiers mm -hmm. and being able to help my community out. Uh, Ezzy, since then, my, my dog, she's become a service dog, mm -hmm. and she was made a full member of the State Defense Force and a sergeant <laughs> and has more rank than some of my soldiers. Um, but I'm glad I'm still able to make a contribution, still stay in uniform, mm -hmm. and help my community out. Now, do you have a regular paying job at this point, or is it a disability? I do. Army? I'm at the moment. I'm still working as an EMT. I work in a mobile COVID vaccination clinic, okay. going around the state giving COVID vaccinations. Mm -hmm. um, I still get to teach a little bit to the nurses and EMTs, which is to me is a great thing, being mm -hmm. able to help out. As he gets to go with me to my clinics. She's been a great help giving kids their shots mm -hmm. that are scared of needles. I'll bring them alongside of them and tell them focus on her, pet her. And by that time, they don't realize that they've already had their shot done. Mm -hmm. um, the older folks come through my clinics and they're like, well, she's such a mild mannered dog. We want to take her home. Um, I'm actually switching roles and going back to being becoming a medical assistant here in Grand Rapids for a place called Catherine's Health. Mm -hmm. um, they serve the um, uh, populace that, um, that may not be able to afford health care. And they've actually invited me to bring Ezzy along with mm -hmm. me. 
So I'm glad I still get to help out people. Um, I still get to teach people things, and my dog gets to travel with me. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, in a kind of a, we're going to close this out, kind of in, a, in a bigger picture sense, what do you think overall you've kind of taken out of your experience in the military, or how has that affected you or shaped you? Overall, I've enjoyed my time. Uh, people remember me for what I do. People still take care of me. I, I'm still taking care of vets. I'm still working with soldiers in the State Defense Force, and they're coming to me asking me how to do things. So mm -hmm. I, I've been asked to take on other leadership roles, but I've decided um, where I'm at, I've got a bigger influence mm -hmm. than just the smaller roles. Yeah, I'm, I'm influencing soldiers there, but I've got a bigger picture that I'm taking care of. Mm -hmm. um, and it means a lot to me that I'm making a difference in people's lives. A couple of weeks ago, I met a veteran down in Battle Creek that he was a Marine, uh, Marine Infantry. I started talking to him and told him I was a combat medic for the Army, and he's like, oh, you're Doc. Mm -hmm. I have more respect for Doc mm -hmm. than I do my own personal doctor. Mm -hmm. And he explained to the staff that Doc is the closest thing you get to a doctor on the battlefield, and Doc does a little bit of everything. And he got teary-eyed talking about his doc, who he m got to see again mm -hmm. in Battle Creek, because doc took care of them and wasn't afraid to get on their case if they were doing something wrong to take care of them. I went in, checked on some care over the phone with him for the VA, mm -hmm. found out he didn't have it, so that told us how to proceed with his care in the clinic. And they told me, oh, well, he's not getting all his shots. And I'm like, really? I went out and had a discussion with him. He's like, well, I really didn't have a good experience with that shot. I'm like, and so I explained the history behind it and explained why he was getting his shots to that day. And um, he said something about going back to see his medic. I'm like, you know what? When you see your corpsman again, when you see Doc, tell him about the Doc that you just saw today that wasn't afraid to get on your case for not taking care of yourself. And he got teary-eyed again because here's a doc he doesn't know that's looking out for him. He's not going to remember my name, but he's going to remember a new doc mm -hmm. came around, was looking out for him, and got on his case to take care of himself. If I can make a difference in somebody's life like that, that makes a huge difference to me. All right which should be the place where I close out, but there is one other thing I did want to ask about, and that is, of course, the whole Afghan conflict from the American side uh, kind of came to an end relatively recently. As that played out, were you at all surprised by what happened? Unfortunately, and I was seeing this in Iraq, I knew the moment we pulled out of Afghanistan that um, mm -hmm. the... Um, Muslim groups that wanted power would take over again. Mm -hmm. I thought we were doing a good thing there. We mm -hmm. were making di a difference in people's lives. Even though some of the um, accidents that were happening on local populace was because of us. Mm -hmm. And because we were there, th um, the local groups that didn't like it would go at, uh, go at each other's throats. I feel it's unfortunate we pulled out because now they're going back to the way things were when we came mm -hmm. in. Girls are not getting that education. Women are b relegated back to third-class citizens. And everybody's being controlled through fear again. Mm -hmm. uh, granted, we couldn't stay there forever, but now people are no longer able to get the freedoms that we were able to afford them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it will remain to be seen how that plays out in the long yes. run and how much change there has been in that culture yep. and how that, all that goes. But yeah, I think that's one of the problems in a way with being a modern soldier, I guess, is yes. you, you go where they send you and you do what you're supposed to do, you do the best job you can, but that's not a guarantee of victory in, in the conventional sense yes. anymore. 
but you can look at what you did and recognize that you did I the made best a difference could, in somebody's difference. life out there and they back home they would be either in an intensive care unit for the care I provided and for them to survive and have a better quality mm -hmm. of life I made a difference for them